Good evening, one and all. On behalf of Information Science and Engineering and the Department of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, Vidyavadaka College of Engineering, Mysuru, I take this opportunity to welcome today's resource person, Dr. Vinayak Elangon, Assistant Professor of Computer Science, Information Science and Technology Department, Penn State University at Abington, Abington, Pennsylvania, USA. And also, I would like to welcome all the participants. So here, just I would like to give the brief introduction of today's resource person. So Dr. Vinayak Elangovan research interest is mainly on the area of computer vision and machine learning. The practical applications of his research focus can be used in battlefield intelligence, homeland security applications, manufacturing industries, mechanical applications, medical analysis, and many other civilian applications. His primary focus is in developing learning algorithms in the area of computer vision and sequential data analysis with keen interest in software applications development and database management. So I, once again, I welcome you, sir, for this session. And also, I thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to be a resource person for this session. And uh, as you all know that the topic of today's session is on group activity detection and recognition in persistent surveillance system. So, sir will be talking briefly about this topic. That is, understanding of group activities can be valuable for both military and surveillance applications. A commonly practiced approach for understanding of group activities that of spatio-temporal analysis of video imagery data However, constructing mindful evidence out of video imagery is a real challenge since the associated data may contain fragmented information which complicates data processing, data association and correlation and data fusion. A cognitive processing model is therefore required to assist it in analyzing imagery data with varying degree of contextual details extract and interference spatio-temporal information pertaining to correlated group, group activity observations and generate a summary annotation of occurred group activity events. So once again, I welcome the resource person and also all the participants. So now I request the resource person to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Um. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And um, as um, Dr. Vinodra said, um, I want to give an overview of group activity detection and recognition in uh, the and surveillance system. So before we talk more about the group activity detection, uh, I want to <laughs> emphasize more on the security aspect. Um, security is very important, uh, no matter what domain of interest you have. Uh, name it manufacturing industries or homeland security or in battlefield or any sub civilian environment, security is always very, very important. So if you look at this particular image of civilian safety, <coughs> this image was taken in around 2011. So this was taken in Times Square in Manhattan, New York. So what happened here is you see the person at circle around. So that person, uh, he had an SUV, so he parked this SUV, he got off from the SUV, he was carrying a bag, and he dropped it back under the post, and he changed his shirt, and left his bag unattended, and he left the scene. So somebody was watching this scene, and they felt very suspicious, so they called 911. <laughs> so immediately the cops came, they found some bomb materials in his bag, and somehow they traced him. They went to his apartment. They found more bomb materials. So, uh, so the issue here is, what if that person uh, who saw the entire incident didn't take time to report to the authorities? <laughs> or what if, if no one sees that incident? So some disaster would happen. So here, if we have a system, 
instance, we this is actually taken from a security camera. So if we have a system which can identify normal and abnormal behavior and characterize those and send those information to the authorities, so the authorities can take the action. So that would be great. <coughs> so that is that, that one instance is actually a, a great motivation for us to work more on this information. And having said that, soon after this incident happened, um, there was a panic around that entire area. Uh, so immediately, I think within a week, uh, the 911, they got a call that there was an unattended package in the road. So they immediately went and uh, found that bag contains only uh, empty cans of coke. And in fact, they, they brought all the bomb squad and, and the canine, the dogs and everything to inspect the object. So, uh, so here, what happens here is, uh, since that, this incident created a panic, um, people were so much cautious and aware of the situation, so they started reporting for each and everything. Okay. So here, if we have a system which can clearly identify these activities and report these activities to the authority and finally give the decision to the humans, then that would be great. So that would minimize so much time and effort, and it will also um, take care of those concerns. So, uh, so before I jump into the group activity, I want to give an introduction. What do you mean by group activity? So typically in a group activity, um, it involves a group of people, a group of people interacting with each other, or a group of people interacting with objects, or interacting with vehicles and so on. So what we are interested in here is we want to identify these kind of interactions. We want to characterize those interactions. And we want to <coughs> generate some meaningful information about that scene. Okay? So to do this, <coughs> what we need to do here is we need to analyze that entire video. So we need to take the video. And what video into images and analyze each image to make some <laughs> to extract some information, meaningful information to these images. Okay. But extracting this information is always a real challenge. So I want to talk a little bit about what kind of challenges we have in extracting these information in the upcoming summit. So typically what we do is when we extract the events from the image. The events can be generated by an, um, a single entity or it can be generated by multiple entities. So these events, if we combine and try to analyze it, they can form an activity. And, and um, a sequence of activity together can form a group activity. So to detect the group activity, first of all, we need to detect the actions, the events. So once we detect the actions, sequence of actions can form an activity. So once we detect more activities, we form, we identify a group activity. To perform this group activity, we need to understand three different kinds of interactions. So we need to find out how the humans interact with other humans. So when they're interacting, let's say if a person is shaking hands with another person, or if, if waving, um, another person, we want to uh, detect all these kind of interactions. So when we uh, <coughs> detect these kind of interactions, there are a couple of things we can observe. So we can try to find out what kind of relation these two have. If someone is hugging uh, a person, then we can say that they have some kind of close relation. If someone is just waving to another person, that might be a distant relation. Um, considering the physical distance here. Okay. So we want to find out these kind of interactions from human human interactions. And another uh, important interaction we need to find out is how the humans are interacting with the objects. For example, is the person is carrying the object or is the person is dropping the object or placing the object inside a vehicle or uh, leaving the object unattended? All these kind of interactions we want. And the most important thing is human-vehicle interaction. So 
So uh, if you look at most of the suspicious activity, most involves a weight. So we want to detect what kind of interaction the person can have with the group. For example, opening the door, closing the door, opening the trunk, closing the trunk, and so on. So to detect a group activity and to recognize a group activity, we need to detect all these kind of interactions. Human-human interaction, human-object interactions, and human vehicle interaction. So um, but today I'm going to focus more on the human vehicle interaction. I'm going to give you an overview how we are detecting this human vehicle interaction and what information we can extract by detecting this human vehicle interaction. <laughs> so before we talk about this human vehicle interaction, I want to give you an overview of uh, what information we can understand from an image. And for that, I want to um, give an introduction of what is an image. So once we try to understand the information from this image, and then we can go over a typical activity recognition system, and then we can um, talk more about human vehicle interactions. Okay. So, um, so any suspicious any activities that you want to monitor, if you want to classify into normal and abnormal behavior, so we usually take the video image, video as a primary source. Okay. So we can also use an acoustic sensor to detect the sound and classify the sound. But in most security cameras, they have uh, they take the video and convert the video into sequence of images. And try to process these images. So when we try to get some meaningful information from these images, it involves three level of process: low level process, mid level process, and high level process. In general, this low level and mid level process we will call we will use more image processing techniques. So that's where the computer vision comes in. Computer vision is nothing but how the computer can see an image and understand information from this image. So that's called computer vision. So once we extract this information from these images, higher level process is applied. So that's where the machine learning algorithms come into picture. <laughs> so in low level processing, so typically what we do, we convert the video into images and uh, we resize all the images into a particular size. And we try to remove the noise. And if the images are blurred, we want to apply some filtration or, or to sharpen the images or to enhance these images. Okay. So once we do that, we can try to bring the foreground by subtracting the background. So we want to extract from the foreground. So once we extract the foreground, we can detect the targets. Once we detect the targets, and we can detect the events and observations. So once we observe, find the observation from each of this image, now we need to make a sense of it. So that is where your high-level processing comes. Okay. So typically, what is an image? An image is a digital image is actually a representation of two-dimensional image. So when we say image, um, we talk about pixels. Pixels are nothing but it's a picture element. So they are the units for an image. So, um, <coughs> so now most of us have a smartphone. So if you have an iPhone, uh, we always look at um, what is how much um, what is the specification of the camera. So when we say eleven megapixel, which means that when you take an image. An image contains 11 megapixels. So that much information one image can see. Okay. So um, we want to take those images and process it. When we are processing it, we are processing each of the pixel elements in the image. Okay. So that's why we always consider these three uh, <coughs> color images. We have binary image, we have grayscale, we have color. So let's say if you want more information from an image, we always take the color image. But if you want to get um, a few information, we don't, we're not looking at a very, very specific, minute details of the image. 
then we can convert that color image to a grayscale, and we can process the grayscale. Or if we want to get only uh, <coughs> an overlay or overview of that image, we can convert that image to a binary scale. Okay? So then we have a binary image, which means that each pixel can contain only two bits of information. It's actually one bit of information. Either it can be zero or it can be one. So either it can be white or it can be black. The typical color images, if you take uh, these color images, are have two channels R, G, P. The R is the red component of an image, B is the blue component of an image, G is the blue component of an image. So combining these three components, you get you get the actual color image. Okay. So each component um, can hold up to eight bits of information. So when we say eight bits, it's actually two to the power eight, right? So that gives us two fifty-six. So one pixel. Okay. So you can have up to two fifty-six times two fifty-six times two fifty-six colors in you can represent in your image. If you have three million colors to represent in color. So it depends on what details you're looking at. If we are looking at the facial expression, we want to look at the color of the face and so on, then we process the color image. Okay? But if you just want to look at the profile, then we can use the binary image to process the image. Or if I want to find uh, recognize a face, I'm not worried about the emotions and so on. The color of the face, I can just use a grayscale image to do it. Okay. So typically, when you want to understand the images, um, we perform so many operations. For example, we can perform an histogram to understand how the pixels have been spread in that image. And if you have an old image, if you want to restore the image, we can perform some filtration to restore an image. And we can also perform um, an enhancement on the image so we can extract each and every object in that image. So one common thing we, uh, we use to profile a person in an image is edge detection. Okay. So we can perform an edge detection to get the profile of the object. And we can extract so many information, so many features from that image by performing more image processing. We can also perform more mathematical operations on images. For example, if I have two images, I can try to add these two image. I can try to subtract these two image. I can try to fuse these two image, and I can try to find what are the common features from these two images. So, so many logical operations what we perform, um, <coughs> we can perform on images. So one important thing uh, we always use is the background subtraction, meaning given two images, we subtract these two images, and we want to extract from the image. For example, let's say you uh, capture the image of your room, and now you place an object and capture the image again. So now we can subtract these two images and extract only the foreground. So when you extract only the foreground, you are extracting the the object, the image of the object, what you are placing. The background subtraction is very important here. <laughs> Having said that, it is not as easy as it sounds. So when you are subtracting two images, there's so many um, complexities involved. So the light, light intensity. Okay, if, if you are taking an outdoor image, uh, the light intensity from the sun varies all the time, and you have trees, plants around, uh, birds flying around, all these becomes your background. Okay? So if there are not, if we don't have common background, that particular information becomes a foreground. Okay? So when you're subtracting these two images, you might get a lot, a lot of noise. So we need more image processing to filter these noises and extract only the foreground. So that's why we perform so many morphological operations like erosion, dilation, opening, and closing. So 
For example, if you look at this here, uh, we have two blobs. Blobs are nothing but binary large objects. So we have two wide objects, right? But if you look carefully look at this, we have some connection between these two objects. In reality, we don't need it. We want these two objects to be separated. So I can take each object and profile it and find more information about it. Okay. So to extract this information, I need to perform more morphology operation. So I can perform an erosion. When I perform an erosion, the object shrinks. If I perform a dilation, the object, the log expands. So if I perform a closing, if I have a hole or any unwanted noise, I can close it. Okay. So we're performing more morphology operations. And then once we have this information, now we can start from okay. Segmentation is also one important thing in an image. Okay. For example, I can extract my region of interest and I can project my region of interest. Okay. In this case, um, so based on colors, we can do a segmentation, or based on the pixel intensity, we can do a segmentation. And so, so typically, when we say segmentation, um, the common thing is we always work with the colors. So if I have an image, I can segment that image into different colors. Let's say I the old image I want to represent in four colors. So all colors related to red might be grouped together, or all colors related to yellow might be grouped together and so on. Okay. So when we have these groupings, now we can try to extract. For example, imagine an image of uh, a sea or, or of an ocean okay? um, or any outdoor environment. So if I want to extract the cloud, I can apply a segmentation and I, I, can, I can exactly extract the cloud. Okay? So the cloud might be lightish blue color or white color. So based on segmentation, we can extract that information. Filtration is also very important. So filtration, we, we apply so many filtrations of the images to enhance that image. <laughs> and you see that given two images, we can also perform an image overlay, uh, overlay okay? the Google Maps. So the Google Maps, what we use, uh, the image is what we get from the Google, from the satellite images. It's actually not one. So multiple images have been fused together to give you the actual images from the satellite, right? So how do they do that? They find the common features in the image, and then they, then they overlay these two images to give you one simple image. Okay. Um, image processing has been used extensively in, uh, in movies. Okay. For example, this is a scene from a mat matrix. So the background is actually not the background they are working on. They typically work in a plain background, a green background, and now they can superimpose any background information onto the program. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, image processing has been extensively used in many applications, okay? but it's actually not that easy. So, in we say image processing, we are trying to process each pixel unit in the image, so it is more intense. So, that's why. Instead of taking a large images, we always take a very small size image and try to process it. <laughs> the most security applications, if you go to a parking lot or to a petrol bunk, they might have a security camera, and that might be a grayscale camera. Why they have a grayscale camera? Because they don't want to do so much computation on an image to extract information. What information they need, they can extract it from the grayscale. So coming to our group activity, so this is the uh, overview of the entire system. So initially we have the camera, we take the images, um, we take the video from the camera, convert the videos to images, we try to process each and every image. And when we process it, we detect the target. So if we detect a target, we can recognize what target it is. Is that a human or a vehicle or an object and so on? So once we recognize the object, we can now track the objects. <laughs> so when we do this object tracking, the target tracking, now 
we can try to identify all the events related to this company. If a person is walking, we can detect that event. If a person is running, we can detect that event. So once we have all these events from these images, now we can extract the observations, the uh, activities from these images. Okay. So once we have all these actions, now we can detect a group. A simple scenario. <laughs> For example, um, let's say that you have an image, uh, you have a video of a vehicle parking in a parking lot. A person gets off from the vehicle, he goes to the um, <laughs> trunk, opens the trunk, he takes an object, and then he goes to the wood, opens the wood, and he does something with that object. And now he closes the wood, comes back to the trunk. He keeps the object there and then it goes to the trunk and then it gets inside the network. So, if I have these sequence of images, we can understand that the person is doing some maintenance operation. Maybe he, he or she is changing some oil or um, topping off the fluids or doing some activity. In the okay? So, these are the observations we want to extract from an image. And this is what we want to analyze. So we want to conclude that that the person is doing some maintenance. Okay. So to find, I'm going to focus more on the human vehicle interactions. Now. <laughs> to find what kind of interaction a person can have with the vehicle, we need to extract all the taxonomy information about this. For example, we want to identify uh, what kind of interaction a person can have, what information we can extract from an image, what information we can extract from an audio source, and so on. Okay. So a, a person can interact with the vehicle in a number of ways. A person can open the door, close the door, open the trunk, close the trunk. He can open the fuel door and so on. Okay. And uh, he can also do more activities with the vehicle. For example, he can open the wood, take an object from the vehicle, or he can place the object inside the vehicle. Okay. So we are interested in all these kind of activities. <laughs> to perform these activities detection, we are uh, we we develop more HVI ontologies. Okay. For for example, we want to detect each event, and we want to find uh, the relation between the sequence of events. And once we detect those actions, we want to detect more activities. Okay. For example, one of these simple ontology is, let's say I detect a person carrying an, an object. So this is an action. This is an observation I can detect from multiple events. Okay. So once I detect a person carrying an object, once I detect a person opening the vehicle trunk and placing the object inside the trunk, I can conclude that, that the person was involved in Loading an object in the vehicle. Okay? So the loading operation was taking place. <laughs> so we want to detect these kind of activities like loading an object to vehicle, unloading an object to vehicle, and all these kind of activities based on the observations we extract from each image. Okay? <laughs> so in typical human vehicle interactions, we are, uh, if we want to characterize those interactions, we are <sighs> interested in these information, what type of vehicle is that, and what is the color of the vehicle, and what is the speed of the vehicle, you know, and what speed the vehicle is arriving to the scene, and where the vehicle is going, what is the state of the vehicle. When I say state of the vehicle, you're talking about either the vehicle is parked or if the vehicle is moving. And, so on. Okay. and finally, what kind of interaction a person can having, uh, is having with the vehicle. <laughs> So, um, so now I'm just going to focus only on three important kinds of information. I want to talk about the type, I want to talk about the color, and finally the HPR. Okay. If you look at this, why the vehicle orientation is very important. So we are more interested in the vehicle orientation. Okay. For example, if I detect a person, and if I know the orientation of the vehicle, I can find the whereabouts of, about this person. Okay. I can find whether the person is standing next to the wood or is standing next to the trunk or is he the driver? Is he coming out of the front door or is he the passenger? 
is a person that's coming out of the uh, back door and so on. Okay. So what we do is when we extract these targets, so we want to classify these targets. First thing is we differentiate uh, the target from vehicle, human, and objects. Okay. So we develop a Hamming neural network, a simple neural network, where we feed this object information, the images of the object, and we, we develop a classifier to classify these objects. Okay. So once we detect the vehicle, the, I want to classify either the vehicle as, as a sedan, or as a minivan, or as an SUV, or a pickup truck, and so on. So we use a neural network to classify these vehicles. Okay. And this is an example. So once we have a, a, an image, we convert that image to a binary image. So when we have this binary image, I can extract the shape features from this binary image. Okay. And I can apply an edge detection on this binary image to extract the profile of this image. So when we have the profile of the image, I can try to classify either this is an SUV or is a pickup truck or is a car and so on. Okay. To extract the color, so we try to detect a region of interest in the vehicle. And then once we have the region of interest, we can extract the color. So this is also very important. Uh, so why we are very interested in this vehicle orientation. <laughs> okay. So uh, when we want to detect the orientation of the vehicle, uh, one aspect what we consider is detecting the number of wheels. So if I can see two wheels, I can say that the vehicle is in the side position. Okay. So if I can see three wheels, then I can say that the vehicle is in in a in a different orientation okay so extracting this vehicle uh, wheels and finding the distance between these wheels we can try to find the orientation and also by taking a top view measuring the information from the top view by extracting the profile of the top view we can try to find what kind of vehicle it is and what is the orientation okay all right just to summarize, so far uh, we can do a target detection. Okay, so once we detect the target, we, we can use a neural network or any machine learning algorithms to identify the target. So once we identify the target, we can try to profile the target. Or we can try to find more characteristics about the target. We can extract the color information, the shape information, the size information about the target, and so on. So um, we can also extract the orientation. So okay, by counting the number of wheels and finding the distance between these wheels, we can try to find the orientation. Okay. So uh, coming to the human vehicle interactions, we want we are more interested what operations a person can uh, perform uh, with the vehicle. Okay. To detect these kind of interactions, for example, opening a wood and closing a wood and so on, what we did is we uh, develop a CAD model. So given an image, we can try to zone the images into different, different locations. Okay? By zoning these into different locations, if I find a blob of interest, if a person, for example, let's say that if a person is standing in this zone 15, so I can say that, that the person is standing in near the food area of the room. If I find a person standing in this zone 16 and 10, I can say that, that the person is standing in front of me. Okay? So that's how we detect the whereabouts of the person with respect to the vehicle, by zoning the vehicle given an image. Okay? So we can zone in different views. We can uh, zone the vehicle in a side view, or in the top view, or in the front view, or in the back view, and so on. So if you look at this, after we zone the vehicle, if I find a person, for example, over here, I can try to extract the foreground of this person. Okay? So I can try to subtract these two images, and I can try to extract only the foreground. And once I extract the foreground, and I'm going to find which zone this person is, and now I can clearly say that 
that the person is near the trunk of the leaf. So using that HVI is learning, we can detect the multiple postures of the, of the person with respect to the wheel. Okay? So we can detect whether a person is standing or bending or sitting or laying down and so on. Given multiple images, if I perform a sequence analysis, we can say that the person is walking or crawling or sneaking and so on. So finally, when after we extract all the information from the images, we want to make sense out of these images. Okay? So we want to generate some meaningful information about these images. Here, okay? For example, in this scenario, we have two vehicles and we have two uh, people exiting from each vehicle. Okay? So initially, when we found the information, for example, <laughs> we found that the human one was the driver for vehicle one. And human tree was a driver for vehicle two. Okay? And after observing information from this uh, sequence of images, uh, we later found that human one became the driver for vehicle two, and human three became the driver for vehicle two. Okay? So when we have this information, what can we absorb from this information? So we can conclude that they exchanged the vehicle. So those are the kind of information we are interested in extracting from the images. Okay, so to summarize what we did, we take an image, we try to extract the foreground of interest, we identify the target. Once we identify the target, we can find the characteristics of the target. Either the person is wearing a white shirt or a black shirt and so on. So once we detect the target, now we can track the target. When we are tracking the target, we are finding all the events related to that particular event. Okay. Combining all the sequence events, we try to detect some observation, for example, carrying an object. That's an observation, that's an action. So once we have sequence of these actions, we can try to find out what activity was taking place. And we can try to uh, find more information from these sequential information we extracted from the images. So that's all I have today. And I just want to let you know that um, this research was initiated at Tennessee State University under the guidance of uh, Dr. Amler. And at this point, I can take any questions if you have. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, if anyone have any questions, I can answer them. Yes. Any questions from the audience? Just for the time constraint, I just gave you an overview of the system. Uh, we didn't talk more about the technologists involved here, um, but that would take more time. Okay, as there is no uh, questions from the audience, sir, so we'll end the session. So on behalf of the Department of Information Science and Engineering and from the Department of uh, from the Department of Information Science and Engineering and from the Department of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, I would like to thank the today's person, uh, Dr. Vinayak Elangovan, for sharing his knowledge. I hope the session was very useful and informative for all the participants. And also, I would like to thank all the participants for taking part in this uh, session. So, and uh, I will post the feedback link. Once if you fill the for feedback link, you will get the e-certificate. Thank you all. Sir, once again, thank you, sir, 
for uh, sparing your valuable time and uh, sharing the knowledge uh, the session was very informative and it was useful sir thank you thank thank you so much for the opportunity thank you sir